The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, no such thing shall ever happen to you. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. But whoever wishes to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Or what can one give in exchange for their life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay all according to their conduct. My sisters and brothers, the Gospel of the Lord. Maybe many of you are familiar with the, uh, the expression that uh, a hell is other people. Anybody uh, have that expression in your mind that, you, that comes up occasionally? I remember the first time I heard it, uh, I was in college and someone said, oh yeah, this is a... Uh, a quote from Jean-Paul Sartre, which who I didn't know, and it was in a play called No Exit, which I hadn't read, and they said, but hell is other people. And when I heard it, I thought, that makes a lot of sense, actually. You know, I have experience of hell being other people, a lot, you know, and at that time I thought, oh, that explains it. That's what hell is, that it's other people, you know? And it was a very specific moment when I thought, is that, is that what other people are for us? And we have this preaching series ahead of us called Other People, in which we get to answer that question of who are other people for us? And it's super important how we answer that because then we kind of set what, what's possible for other people to be in our lives. What's possible, whether they're going to be a blessing or a burden. A bunch of that depends on what we bring to that conversation, how our, our default setting is, that people are just going to be hell or not. Because other people are complicated, right? I mean, much more complicated than we are. I mean, they're other and they're people, so they're usually a mess, right? Is that they have all kinds of imperfections and then, then our imperfections come up when their imperfections get started and, and then there's all the suffering that other people usually have going on, right? They're human beings, so they're suffering. There's almost always suffering and when you pay attention, you see a lot of it in people. You know, suffering from, uh, you know, there's relationships that go bad or a job that's not working out or a life that just is hard day in and day out. People taking care of, of relatives who are ill or people losing people um, too soon and in horrible ways and suffering of uh, people that think that they're not enough. I mean, any range of those kind of suffering that other people can bring to the equation, right? And so you might be tempted to think, I'll just, thank you, I'll just go it alone. I'll just go it alone. And maybe that is what Sartre was trying to say, you know, the famous philosopher. His goal was to try to figure out human freedom. But he was also saying that our identity is built around other people's judgment of us, that we're in relationship all the time, all the time. And it's not just, it's kind of taken out of context when you say hell is other people. He would say that hell and heaven and everything in between is other people because we know ourselves in relationship to other people. Which brings us to this, this reading that we just heard from the life of Jesus as told by St. Matthew. And, and we get to see Jesus in relationship with other people, I mean, throughout the gospel, but this is a, a really good example of him in relationship with other people. Now, just to set the context, uh, right before this incident, Jesus had been asking around, like, who do people say that I am? And Simon, who's Simon at that point, says, he says, well, I think you're the Christ. And this is the right answer. And so Jesus changes his name from Simon to Peter and says, you're the rock on which I'm going to build my church. You're, you're, you're it. I think you're great. I'm going to give you all this, all this responsibility and things are going great. And you turn the page if you're reading the Bible and suddenly things go real sideways. Because at that point, Jesus started telling his disciples, these other people, he says, okay, so this is what's going to happen, is that I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer at the hands of religious authorities, people that should welcome me. I'm going to suffer, 
and I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to rise again. This is not met with a lot of enthusiasm by Peter at all. Peter's like, whoa, wait, wait a second. And he says, no, that should not happen to you. That should not happen to you. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, calls him Satan. Well, he was just called the rock. But now you're Satan, and get behind me, and you're an obstacle, and you're thinking not like God, but like people do. That's the problem? Jesus says, your problem is you're thinking like a human being and not like God. Well, what does that, what could that mean for us? What could that mean? So just to back up, Peter responds badly to Jesus saying there's going to be suffering. Jesus isn't even suffering yet, and Peter's freaked out, like, ugh. Anybody like that around suffering? Like, I don't even want to hear about you. Like, much less right up close, you re react badly to other people's suffering because you can't fix it. It's too big. It shouldn't happen, right? And so, so Peter tries to, you know, close it down. Like, no, no, that shouldn't happen. Now, Jesus says, you're thinking like a human being, not like God. Here's what I think is interesting in there. Is that, you know, God's, God's big and God sees everything. God sees the whole picture. Human beings are small, and we see just part of the picture, just part of it rather than the whole thing. So even though Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, die, and be raised, it seems like Peter responds to the suffering and the, the death part, not to the whole picture. Doesn't see the whole picture. And so Jesus is trying to say, you're thinking like a human being, just seeing the part rather than going for the whole thing. Because if you saw the whole thing, you could see what I'm offering you. You have been a follower of Christ. Now, perk up your ears, this might be you. You've been a follower of Christ, and you think, yeah, Jesus, why not? Good guy, good stories, heals people, walks around, is nice all the time. And you think, yeah. And then you just skip over to like Jesus, you know, uh, being, he's raised from the dead, and he's, he's back. He's kind of wounded, but he's back. But Jesus says, no, you have to follow me as crucified. You have to follow me on the cross, right? Because the next thing he says is, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. You're going to have to lose your life for me. You're going to have to find your way into relationship with suffering, right? With suffering. And with that will come wholeness, salvation, and part of the shared project. If you can just simmer down and not be freaked out by the suffering part, and see the whole, and see the resurrection, and the hope that is part of the whole story. Seeing it like God sees it. That's our invitation. Now, if you have been in, in your life, if suffering has popped up in relationships, and you just shied away, and maybe there's someone who's suffering in your life right now that you don't call or text, you feel you should, and you think, oh, I should, but then they're gonna, they're gonna lay that, all that stuff on me because they're, they're suffering. There's a lot of pain there. How do I? And you think, oh, I'll, just, I'll just choose isolation. I'll just choose to be more alone rather than engaging in suffering. I'm going to offer just three things that you might do if there's someone like that in your life. Maybe a coworker, relative. Maybe you're married to that person. When you, things that Peter didn't do. You can actually listen to the person. Listen to the person. Peter doesn't. He just gets in there and starts talking. Listen to the person. Do things like eye contact with someone who is suffering. Like, look at them. See them, right? Because some people that are in pain want to be seen, yeah? right? I mean, we all do. And then thirdly, ask questions. Ask questions. Tell me more. What happened? Why? How did it go? And by the way, you'll be able to see your own uh, awkwardness or uncomfort, discomfort, recede as you are able to focus on them and move further into life with them. Now, why is this important to do not only for just your friends, coworkers, people that you see around, maybe people on the street? Because we get to be witnesses to hope. We get to be witnesses to the whole story. We get to be those people that occasionally are able to glimpse how God sees the world, which is already redeemed, shot through with hope and opportunity and possibility that's on the other side or through and somehow is connected to that suffering and the cross. 
We're not sure how that works, but somehow we experience that, that the wholeness of the, of the, of the person is shot through with hope, and that's what we get to witness. That's what we get to be on mission with Christ in the world to witness that to other people that desperately need it, and we need it as well.